Hi everybody, this is Dan Stolbarger and welcome back to our deep dive study in the Gospel of John. This is session 12 and we'll be covering chapters 14 and 15. So uh, let's prepare our hearts, let's pray and let's jump in. Jesus, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you that it illuminates our paths and thank you specifically for these two chapters tonight. Lord, we just pray that we can embrace them. We can hear them spoken to us. And Lord, give us the courage, the strength to walk in your ways, to keep your commandments. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Got your Bibles open? Chapter 14. <clears throat> just a reminder that there is a PDF PowerPoint uh, notes that goes with this YouTube and you can access them uh, just on the link on the YouTube page or go to our website at holygroundexplorations.com. Uh, I'll never forget chapter 14. I remember going to uh, Calvary Chapel up in Costa Mesa when I first became a believer. And I remember Pastor Chuck teaching on this chapter and it's interesting he began by saying of all the chapters in the bible if there's one that you should commit to memory it would have to be chapter 14. And i've never forgotten that the importance of this chapter and i think it's important that we set the context once again jesus has had the Last Supper with his disciples. He's girded himself with a towel and washed their feet and said, if I, your teacher and Lord, if I, your rabbi and Lord, have done this, you ought to do it to one another. He's talked to them about someone who's going to betray him. He's spoken to them about him going away. And before they make their way out the door and head down the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, these next few chapters, he speaks to them. His public ministry is over. This is just him and his boys. And he's sharing things that I think we need to hear today as well. As followers of Jesus, these words are intended for us. So he begins by saying, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, <clears throat> but I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. <laughs> this we can call chapter 14 sort of the father chapter because that word father is mentioned 23 times in this chapter. And he begins with those words, let not your heart be troubled. The disciples had reason to be troubled at this time. Jesus had just told them that one of them was a traitor. And remember, all eyes didn't just lock on to Judas at that moment. They all had this introspection of saying, is it, could it possibly be me? And then he said <clears throat> that they would all deny him. And then he said that he was going to leave them that night. So what's not to have your heart be troubled by? It's all there. And so he goes on. <clears throat> and these are the words again that bring us comfort. Because he's going to promise peace that passes all understanding. And he's going to tell us in so many words, I am in control. And then he's going to speak with confidence about heaven. 
He's going to say, I'm going to the father's house and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he says, and I'm going to come and I'm going to receive you. And so the biggest fear, or at least one of the biggest fear of all of us is death. It is the end of our human existence on this planet. <clears throat> the statistics of death, as you know, not meaning to be funny, is, you know, 100% of us are going to die. Are you ready? What's that moment going to be like? I actually believe that when he says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you. I think the first recollection that we will have when we cross that threshold is to be in his presence. I believe that part of the greatness of God is that he receives us into heaven. Let not your hearts be troubled. Then he goes on, and I, I'll insert this here because, about, again, back to this chapter. <clears throat> and on this next slide, I have a quote. I entitled it, My Peter Pan. <clears throat> but James Barry was the man who wrote Peter Pan. It's near and dear to my heart because that was all, that was sort of the nickname that I had for my middle son who's in heaven right now. He was our Peter Pan. Um, but James Berry was the man who wrote Peter Pan and among other works. But one of his books that he wrote was about his mother, Margaret Ogilvie, and his growing up in Scotland. His mother endured a lot of misery in life, including the tragic death of one of her sons. According to Morrison, Barry wrote that his mother's favorite Bible chapter was this one, John chapter 14, and that she read it so much that when her Bible was opened and set down, the pages naturally fell to this chapter, to this place. And Barry said that when she was old and she no longer could read the words, that she would literally stoop down to her Bible and kiss the page where John 14 was written. Why? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and I'll come and I will receive you. What comfort there is to know that our loved ones who know Jesus, he received them, has a place for them. And even though <clears throat> I think they've got a lot to do and enjoy in being in heaven, one day we will see them as well. Let not your hearts be troubled. Well, again, he mentioned early on, <clears throat> as he ended this, he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And then he says, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then it's interesting because thankfully Thomas says to him, hmm, and, and I know in our last night's Bible study, we talked about it's uh, so hard for us to go back in time and understand they didn't have Bibles laying around. They hadn't read this chapter. They've got a lot going on. And as I mentioned, a lot of reasons to be troubled but they've just experienced the triumphal entry and their belief is that soon and very soon, if not this next day after they leave this place, 
Jesus is going to get rid of the Romans and set up the Jewish kingdom. And being his disciples, I wonder what positions will hold. That you have to understand is the mindset. Jesus, Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, not suffering servant. So in hearing all this, Thomas has the guts to say, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? <clears throat> and then Jesus delivers a statement that there are times I wish was not in the Bible, but make no doubt about it. It is, it's intentional. And in the Greek, it's dramatically exclusive because he's going to say these words. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Let that sink in because it's the challenge in the day in which we live where our culture is demanding of Christianity to be more inclusive and not exclusive. And this statement, again, in the Greek, is dramatically exclusive. I am it. There is no other way, is what Jesus says. My friend Todd Hornby writes for our daily devotions that we sent out called Kafir. And if you need a daily devotion, just a, a structured, in a sense, a reading through the Bible schedule, join us. Just go to our website at holygroundexplorations.com. Uh, There's a, a link there that you can just sign up for the Kafir Bible program. And uh, Todd writes for it. And we usually cover three chapters. It's always a gospel. It's always a psalm or wisdom literature. And then wherever we might be at that point in time, making our way through the entire Bible chapter and verse. But Todd wrote about the psalm this week. He said, <clears throat> does it feel like our world is on uncertain footing these days? My news feed and social media they're blowing up with everything pride and rainbow related right now because, again, keep in mind, it is not pride parade. It's not pride day. It's now the pride month. And he says, once upon a time, we were told, believers, we were told that we needed to be more tolerant. And now we're told that it's not enough just to be tolerant. We need to affirm and to ally, to be an ally. And if we don't toe the line, we are bigots and we are haters. And then they say, and your silence is violence. How do we handle passages like this when our culture is demanding us to be more inclusive? The days will get dark and they're getting darker. And the brilliance of light, the, the light is more brilliant at the darkest part of the night than it is at the haze or when the sun, the golden hour is just going down. And I think we're entering into that time where the brilliance of our Savior and his teachings need to be lived out. And we'll get a lot of that tonight so that his light will shine in the darkness and draw all men unto him. It is exclusive. There's no getting around it. <laughs> Verse seven, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and you've seen him. And throughout these last few chapters, John is making a point of connecting 
the Father and the Son, the aspects of the Trinity, two separate and yet united. And later in this chapter, we're getting that last and final strand, three chords, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But they're always outdoing one another, never exalting themselves, always the others, And the word that keeps coming through is, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, It's the unity of this. And so Jesus is saying, "If if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip has the guts to say, Lord, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. Give us absolute 100% locked down, locked solid proof. Show us the Father and we'll be good. And Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long and yet You have not known me, Philip. And then note these words. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You know, it's impossible for our human minds to understand, comprehend the Trinity. If we could, we would be its equal. But this is what we know. The greatest of all miracles, in my opinion, is not the resurrection, it's the incarnation. It's when God became man and tabernacled among us, laying aside and putting on 100% man and 100% God. When we think about the Father, no human form, Scripture at best tells us that God is light. He's a spirit. When Moses encounters God, it's a burning bush. And so the only form of God that even the angels have ever seen is Jesus. Think about it. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan himself. Uh, And he has fasted 40 days and he combats him with the word of God. It says that angels came to minister to him. It's possible that that was their first opportunity to visually see God. Interesting. Well, let's go on because Jesus says to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen God, the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, verse 12, believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. (laughs) Oh my, what a verse, right? Um, It's been abused so often. I'm simply going to try to make it easy as possible. The the greater works that we will do, I don't think have anything to do with something more sensational 
are greater in magnitude than what Jesus did. Walking on water, calming the storm by his words, raising the dead. Uh, uh, No, he's not saying you're going to do even greater things than that. I think it has to do with scope. I think that when Jesus, at best, he had his 12. And then we know that there were 70 that he sent out. We know there was a contingency of women that followed him. But at the most, I think you're dealing with something a little less than 100 people. Of, but, but really direct influence, uh, the 12, the 70. But when Peter actually speaks on the day of Pentecost, the message is not going out to less than a hundred, it's thousands. So I think these greater works have to do with the scope and the numbers, not more sensational, miraculous works. And then we have that issue, and it'll come up again here, that whatever you ask in my name, I will do. And again, it's very simple. The key is asking in his name according to his character, according to his authority. The test of any prayer is, can I make this in the name of Jesus? No man, for instance, could pray for personal revenge, for personal ambition, for some unworthy and unchristian object in the name of Jesus, no. It has to be in accordance with who he is and what he's about. Well, again, Precious Promises, a chapter that deserves to be memorized. Uh, Many of these verses I know you've heard. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So last night we started by saying in our study when we got to this section, um, so that it's just not Christianese, uh, concepts that have no details that we can kind of spew out. But Jesus is going to say consistently, if you love me, keep my word. Don't just be hearers, but be doers. So he says here, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the question that we went around the circle saying, what are his commandments? What are they? Where do we find them? We don't have to come up with them in our own mind. It's in the word of God, who he is. Which is why as kafir, young lions, that's what that word means in Hebrew. That's why in our in our daily Bible readings, it's always going to have a gospel until we have his commandments, his teachings completely memorized. We need to bathe ourselves in his words because if we claim to love him, we must be like him and keep his commandments. Will we be perfect? No. Do we have to do it on our own? No. Why? Look what he says. I'm going to give you some help. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the helper, the one who comes alongside of, that's the Greek word here for helper, paraclete. He's going to not just be with you, but he's going to soon be in you. When you receive Jesus, The spirit of the living God dwells within you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Then he goes on and he says in verse 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. 
Now, keep in mind the context. Think about what these disciples are hearing. No, here comes King Jesus. He's going to throw out the rotten Rome and set up the kingdom. So what is he talking about here? A little while longer, the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. (laughs) We're going to get a lot of this, thank God, over the next few chapters. I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Without me, you can't do anything. Okay? And then he says again, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then in the midst of all of this, Judas, in verse 22, not Iscariot, says to him, one of the twelve, Lord, I don't get it. Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Keep in mind, Judas is still envisioning King Jesus, not not the one riding on a lowly donkey, not the Lamb of God who's going to be slain for the sins of the world, but the King Jesus on a white horse that will conquer and it's coming even it might be tomorrow. This is his mindset. So he's asking, how is it that you're going to manifest all of that to us? And the world's not going to see it. And Jesus answered and said to him, pump the brakes. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but it's the father's who sent me. Was that an answer? I think the disciples are still confused. But notice what follows. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will come and teach you all things, and he will bring to you remembrance all the things that I said to you. Peace. I leave with you my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do you know that the difference? there's a difference between the peace that Jesus gives and the peace that this world has to offer? And then he reiterates what he started the chapter with. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away. Are you hearing that? Peter, Levi, Thomas, I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. So now we have part of, and and keep these things in mind, part of the job description of the helper, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would teach the disciples what more they needed to know and would also supernaturally bring to remembrance the words of Jesus, both for their benefit and the writing of the Gospels. The Spirit of God will bring those words alive. And it's still true today. And then we have the peace, 
the shalom of God. When someone, by the way, in Israel, even in today, but in that ancient culture, when they said peace as they departed, shalom, they said it without any sort of special meaning. It was a greeting. It was like when we say goodbye, right? Goodbye. Do you know what that literally means, goodbye? It means God be with you, but goodbye. That's what it comes from, God be with you. But we really don't mean that. It's just a greeting for us. And Jesus wanted them to know when he said, peace, I leave with you. It wasn't casual, empty words the way most people said it. The rabbis will say when you wish someone shalom or peace, you wish for them the experience that Adam and Eve had in the garden before the fall, that richness of a fellowship and relationship with God. Uh, Today, you'll hear that word more than any other in Israel, and none of them probably have the meaning of it in mind when they wish it. It's like going to Hawaii and hearing aloha, okay? Shalom, much more than empty words of greeting that the world has to offer. It's deep-seated. It's God's perfect peace, which comes when you understand you're never alone because he will not leave you orphaned. And he's not just coming alongside, but he's within you. The richness of fellowship is his peace. Verse 29, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I'm going to stop there for a second. I want to talk a bit about the importance of prophecy. There are many churches today, there's many pastors today, there are many pulpits today that refuse to teach prophecy. They believe that it's either too complicated or too divisive, both very much unfortunate that they see it that way. Because prophecy from God, according to this, validates who he is. I am the one who knows the end from the beginning. I'm going to tell you something before it comes so that when it does come to pass, you will know who I am and you may believe. Do you know that it's Judeo-Christians, Christianity? Do you know that the Bible is filled with more, more verses about prophecy than anything else? Do you know that the Quran has no prophecy in it? Do you know that the writings, the books of Hinduism and Buddhists have no prophecy in them whatsoever? No other religious books of merit, of note, have prophecy. Only our Bible. And to ignore prophecy, in my opinion, takes away one of the proofs of the existence of God. I understand the abuses, but there's two sides of that coin. And to refuse to teach prophecy robs the believer in this day. To only talk about prophecy then fills the mind and we need to hear those words, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Be doers. So I'll get off my soapbox and we'll finish this chapter. Verse 30 says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He is nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the father. And as the father gives me commandment, so I do. So arise and let us go from here. So at this point, and, and still got a couple chapters to go, so it's not like they're immediately opening the door and closing it. But at this point, 
Jesus is preparing his disciples and they will be leaving and they'll slowly make their way towards the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, It's interesting that knowing everything that was before him, as they got ready to go and to leave, one would have thought that such a night as this, that the deepest craving of Jesus would have been to be alone. He could not leave them and go out alone. He needed and wanted to be with them. He loved them far too deeply to abandon them at this moment. They might forsake him as they would do soon, but it was impossible for him to forsake them. The tangible love of God. So that's that chapter. Let's move on with the time that we have left to chapter 15. Um, Words like abide, keeping his commandments, if you love him. Uh, that's what we're going to be encountering in the next few passages. Uh, again, we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to abide in him? Also, we're going to learn about God's ways, and they're not always our ways. So it begins with him saying, picture this. I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Left to itself, a vine will produce a good deal of unproductive growth. For maximum fruitfulness, extensive Let me say that again. Extensive pruning is essential. The means by which God prunes or how he cleans is done by using the word of God. Because the word of God condemns sin The word of God inspires holiness. The word of God promotes growth. The word keeps our heart clean by pointing out the areas that need confession. The word helps remove the dirt. The word of God, it convicts those who read it reverently. Ephesians 5 says that we are cleansed with the washing of the word, the washing of water by the word of God. So we need God's word to guide our path, to know what his commandments are, to understand what it means to abide in him. It's not left to our own devices and thoughts. That's why we need to be diligent workmen of God's word, making those deposits in us. One of the, if not the greatest gift that God gave to the Jewish people was on Mount Sinai when he gave them the Torah, the word. Why? Because they were not left to their own devices to try to figure out what God loves and what God hates. He gave them the word that they might know. 
So in this life that we live, if we claim to be his, we need to abide and follow in his ways and allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. And his goal is not to stop at justification. We are justified, made right by what Jesus Christ did on the cross, his work, his work alone. Nothing we can do can earn justification. It was his finished work. But it does not stop there. The work of the Spirit of God now is to sanctify us before glorification. We will not see glorification until we see him face to face. But we are now in process. Discipleship. Growing. And as we grow here, becoming more like him, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. He's going to convict us. Notice he's not going to condemn us. He's going to convict us, making us more like Jesus, bringing to mind, and we're being cleansed and pruned by the word of God. So make it a point to abide in him, to be a workman. And again, I... I want to invite you to be part of our Kafir Bible community of reading the Word of God daily. Okay, let's let's move on. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me, you can't do anything. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Abiding in Jesus means abiding in his words and having his words live in you and will be visible to those who are seeing you. We should not overlook the importance of the reference to my words. The teaching of of Jesus. The teaching of Jesus is important and is not lightly to be passed over in the interest of promoting religious feelings. What is the word of the Lord? What are his commandments? And then we have that same problem with misusing this text where it says you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you the reality is that that once again is if his words abide in you Spurgeon writes concerning this he says it becomes safe for God to say to the sanctified soul ask what thou wilt and it shall be done unto thee The heavenly instincts of that man, the sanctified man, lead him in the right direction. The grace that is within his soul thrusts down all the covetousness things and lustings and foul desires. And his will is the actual shadow of God's will. The spiritual life is the master in him, and so his aspirations are holy, heavenly, and godlike. You love the things that he loves, and you hate the things that he hates. As the Father loved me, verse 9, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, 
just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I simply want to say this. What's your view of the Father? For many, the view of the Father, when we think of the three entities of the Spirit, the Son, and the Father, more times than not, the thoughts that we have of the Father is a disciplinarian with a big stick waiting for us to mess up so it can whack us from time to time. But the son, Jesus, is the peacemaker. And because of his sacrifice for us, the father can't continue to whack us because he has to see us through what Jesus has accomplished. No, we're told often that the essence of God, of God the father, is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. As the father loved me, I also love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and I abide in his love. It's a love fest. The Trinity is a love fest. And we're to be known by this. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Remember the new commandment that Jesus gave. He didn't say, love others like you love yourself. He said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Takes it up quite a notch, doesn't it? Well, we'll finish out this chapter. Then verse 11 says, uh, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Your joy will be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in my Father's name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Love and joy, and God calls us friends. You can understand why this chapter needs to be committed to memory. My joy remains in you. By the way, the joy of Jesus isn't the same as what commonly is understood as happiness or excitement. The joy of Jesus is not the pleasure of a life at ease. It is the exhilaration of being right with God and walking with him. Walking in his love and walking in his care. Psalm 45 verse 7 says, You love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with what? The oil of joy. Doing being and walking with him. And then we have that verse, greater love has no man than this. And um, for me, coming out of the 70s, in a time where it was popular to not love our military, Vietnam War, whatever it may be, I have come, because of this verse, to have great admiration, respect, and love for our military. 
Because believe me, a lot of blood was shed for your freedom. And greater love has no man than this, than he would lay down his life for his friends. Those in our armed services deserve our respect, our admiration, and our appreciation. Enough said. And then he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And when I was listening to my friend Joe Foch speak on this, one thing that he brought out is that, isn't it amazing? You know, since God is love, sometimes we can look at it and say, well, because he is love, he's got to love me. Okay, so yeah, God loves me. But he likes you. He says, when he calls me friends, it's not like he has to love because God is love. It's his essence. But there's something about God liking me. He likes me. That, that should be wind in your sails to realize that you were created for a purpose and that God knows your name, your every thought, and he likes you as well as loves you. I hope that that stirs something up in you to say, I want to know my friend better. And we'll throw you back into his word to learn more and more about him. We'll throw you back to your knees to talk to him more and more. Yeah, that's what prayer is about, talking to Jesus. Well, we're going to shift here. And... Um, and nine times in these remaining verses, Jesus is going to say, you're going to be hated. It, it, you know, we, we know he's, gonna, he's talked about love. He's talked about peace. He's talked about joy. He's talked about abiding. And now he's going to say, but if you follow me, guess what? You're going to be hated. Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the world might be fulfilled, that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without excuse. Nine times here. We hear that word hate. I read this and it still makes me scratch my head. Christians throughout the centuries have known the hatred of the world and millions have died for Jesus. And it is said that more have died as martyrs for Jesus in the 20th century than in all the previous centuries combined. And then the last comment, hatred is on the rise in regards to how culture views Christianity today. If you follow him, if you profess him, if you love him, if you abide in him, the world will hate you. When you think of the disciples, do you know that all but John 
died horrific deaths, martyred because of walking with Jesus. Why would we expect anything different? Verse 26, as we end, but the helper, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you shall also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The one who walks alongside of us the Spirit of God will dwell in us. We'll get more next week. But everything the Holy Spirit does, know this, is in consistence with the testimony of the nature of Jesus. It is his job to tell us and to show us who Jesus is. Well, that's our study for this week. That's our jumping into the deep end of the pool. I pray that this chapter would be an encouragement to you. And as we move forward, we'll get more about the Holy Spirit in our lives. And without him, we have no power. We can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then next week, we'll talk about Really, when we think about the Lord's Prayer, it's really this one in John 17. The prayer that the Lord, that is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer, is really the disciples' prayer. It's really the model prayer, right? The Lord's Prayer we'll get to in John 17 next week. God bless you and shalom.